Greetings. I am Nitish Mukhopadhyay, professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores. Welcome to the series, The Films of Distinguished Statisticians. It is a joint program of Pfizer Global Research and Development, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores, and the American Statistical Association. The funding helps us to bring the most distinguished statistical scientists to our university. It also allows us to film the Pfizer colloquia and conversations for the archives of the American Statistical Association. Before we begin the 20th colloquium in this series, with deep gratitude, let me mention two colleagues, late Professor Harry Poston from the University of Connecticut Stores and Dr. David Salzberg from Pfizer Incorporated. A bit of history. Late Professor Poston and Dr. Salzberg engineered this program some 30 years ago, and the first film in this series was launched in 1978. I'm especially proud to introduce this 20th colloquium in honor of Dr. Salzberg. The colloquium will be presented by Professor Manny Parson. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Joe Newton from Texas A&M University College Station, who will introduce Professor Parson. Thanks, Nidis. It's my great pleasure to introduce distinguished Professor Emmanuel Parson. Manny was born in New York City in 1929. He attended the Bronx High School of Science, and after bachelor's and doctor degrees in mathematics from Harvard and Berkeley, he spent 15 years at Stanford, eight at State University of New York at Buffalo, and the past 28 years at Texas A&M, where he is a distinguished professor. He has co-authored more than 100 papers and six books. He served on innumerable editorial boards and organized many influential workshops. He's a fellow of the ASA, IMS, AAAS. He won the Samuel S. Wilkes Medal, the ASA Noether Award for Research in Nonparametric Statistics, and many other honors in his career. One of the very small things he did was to be my PhD advisor at Buffalo in 1975. It's my great pleasure to turn the podium over to Professor Emmanuel Parson. I am deeply honored to present a University of Connecticut Statistics Department Pfizer Colloquium Lecture by Distinguished Statisticians. We should begin by expressing thanks to Dr. David Salzberg and remembering Prof Professor Harry Poston, who have enriched us by founding these distinguished lectures. We express thanks also to Pfizer Global Research for its vision and funding the American Statistical Association Distinguished Lecture Series. Thanks also to Professor Nitis Mukhopadhyay for his guidance in helping me prepare this special lecture. I begin by discussing why should you want to know about United Statistics. My talk today presents ideas about the practice of statistical science and the practice of academic statistics. I propose that the optimal statistician is the United Statistician who practices United Statistics and combines Bayesian and Frequentist methods. To define optimal, I define suboptimal, finding the right answer to the wrong question. United Statistics seeks fun and profit by applying the philosophy, discover concepts, grand unified theories, that can be applied in circumstances different from their original context. To solve an applied problem, it helps to learn analogous problems, other scientific applications which pose similar statistical problems. To learn the vision and techniques of statistical theory, it helps to seek analogies between analogies. Important aims of United Statistics are to practice data modeling using both Bayesian and Frequentist statistics to modernize introductory stati courses on statistical methods, how they work and why they work. In 1953, I received my PhD from the Statistical Laboratory at Berkeley, California, with a thesis extending to convergence, uniform in a parameter, 
many limit theorems of probability and statistics. I was able to change my career to time series modeling and function estimation because Professor Jersey Neyman published my thesis as a book. I felt relevant and not perturbed by the frequent debates about the relevance of academic statistics to applications. Relevant to my talk today is a jest popular when I was young. You are a closet Bayesian. Why won't you come out of the closet? A jest for today to Bayesians who use conjugate priors. You are a closet frequentist. Why won't you come out of the closet? Since 1976, my lectures at Harvard and my 1979 JASA paper on non-parametric data modeling, I have been learning about quantiles and the framework they provide for learning almost all of statistical methods. In time series analysis, I advocate working both in the time and frequency domain. And in statistical data analysis, I advocate working in both the distribution and quantile domains, both the frequentist and Bayesian domains. Why every statistician should practice and teach quantile thinking is illustrated by the statement, quote, 10,000 bootstrap samples were generated from these data and the bootstrap sample means were arranged in order, unquote. We should say, one, we computed the sample quantile function of the sample means of 10,000 bootstrap samples. Two, we have thus approximated the population quantile of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Three, we can compute endpoints of bootstrap confidence intervals for the true population mean. These steps describe how the bootstrap percentile method works. Why does it work? My explanation is based on my explanation for the endpoints of traditional Neyman confidence intervals for the true population mean, which I derive from a grand unified theorem of frequentist inference. Confidence interval endpoints can be computed from the quantile function of the population sampling distribution of the sample mean, given that the parameter equals the observed sample mean. A rigorous proof is obtained using concept of inverse p-values, which is optimal path to practicing the definition of statistics as inverse probability, which we now interpret inverse as the inverse of a function. Probability and statistics books are deficient in their discussion of quantiles. Almost all introductory statistics books teach median quartiles, but using confusing definitions, often different in lecture and computing programs. My talk today about a united understanding of the modern history, practice, and teaching of statistics starts with key ideas, defining statistics as problems zero to five, the village of quantiles providing solutions to these problems, a strategy for statistical data modeling abbreviated S-I-E-V-E, -E, pronounced CIV. We emphasize four grand unified theories. One, frequentist inference. Two, Bayesian frequentist inference combined. Three, two sample inference. And four, graphs of confidence belts. I now discuss problems zero to five outline of modern statistics and statistical data modeling. The path to, science, to statistical scholarship, which we call United Statistics, uses as an outline the history of the modern discipline of statistics, which began with Carl Pearson around 1900 and Sir Ronald Fisher in 1922 and 1925 papers. Fisher defined statistical inference from, from a sample as composed of three problems. Problem one, specification, which, we, which I call identification of parametric models. Problem two, estimation, which I call estima estimators and their sampling distributions. Problem three, distribution, which I call valid parameters that fit the sample. Colin Mallows advocates adding the science. Problem zero, identify relevant populations relevant data, scientific questions that are the purpose of a statistical study. 
Problem four, interpret results of statistical analysis to answer scientific questions. Inspired by Tukey's 1962 classic paper on future data analysis and Sir Francis Galton around 1880, we add to the stages of data modeling problem point five, data analysis and quantile analysis. Problems one to three are parametric. When parametric models don't fit, our solution will be non-parametric models. Problem 3.5, non-parametric, and problem 3.1, Bayesian statistical methods. All these problems have versions for independent data, multivariate data, stochastic process data, biostatistical data. A Kaplan-Meier distribution can be rotated to be a sample quantile function and is a solution to problem 0.5. An outline of the problems of statistical data modeling should insert after problem zero, problem point one, data, design, and collection. In discussions of the past, present, future statistics, such as Colin Mallow's paper, Tukey's paper after 40 years in Technometrics, August 2006, the problem of statisticians is alleged to be tendency to be too mathematical and failure to heed the advice, quote, Above all, the statistician must be a scientist, unquote. I believe that this advice is correct for the future health of the interdisciplinary profession of statistics, which we statistical scientists increasingly share with scientists who are not statisticians. But for the discipline of academic statistics, the advice should be, quote, above all, the academic statistician must be a statistical scholar of statistical methods theory and practice that enable successful applications. Academic statisticians have an additional problem to add to the list of problems zero to four defining statistical science. Problem five, learning statistical reasoning, how and why. In the USA, the number of students of introductory statistics may be almost two million a year. Teachers of statistics need scholarship to be qualified for their important mission of providing teaching and consulting education to the enormous number of non-statisticians who want to apply statistical methods. To reform statistical education, I propose teaching statistics one, how methods work, statistics two, why methods work, statistics three, proof of the theory of statistical methods. Now I turn to the village of quantile functions. We start with slide one, which defines a random variable's distribution function and the quantile function. A probability model for a random sample of a random variable y is usually described by its distribution function, capital P equals capital F of little y. The value capital P for a given specified value y could be called its p-value. The inverse p-value problem is finding y for a given p. It arises more often in practice but lacks the standard notation. We define the quantile function y equals q of p. The inverse equation f of q of p equals p is satisfied for all p only when f is continuous. The quantile function q of p is defined in general as the smallest y that f of y is equal to p. If q of p is a function with the mathematical properties of a quantile function, one can simulate a random sample with this quantile by forming capital Q of capital U, where capital U is a uniform 0, 1 random variable. So problem point five, the problem of summarizing an exploratory analysis of a sample, is solved by computing the sample quantile function, by sorting the data to form the order statistics. Exploratory data analysis defines the median, denoted capital Q2, as the middle order statistic when the sample size n is odd, and as the average of the middle values when n is even. We want a definition of sample quantile function whose value at p equal 0.5 is the sample median capital Q2 
and whose values at points 25 and 0.75 define the sample quartiles, capital Q1 and capital Q3. This and other goals can be achieved by our definition of mid-quantile function, capital Q mid of P, which we give in slide two. When Y is discrete, which is true when we have a sample distribution, we want to define a continuous version of the quantile function capital Q mid. And we do that by defining the mid distribution function F mid of Y, which is the distribution function F of Y minus one half the probability of mass function P of Y. This is the mid distribution function jumps halfway at points where the distribution function jumps. Now we take the points F mid of YJ at the distinct values YJ occurring in the sample, and we, at those points, we define the value of Q mid of P to be YJ. And then we join linearly these values. Why do we do this? Well, because there are very many important problems that it solves. The problem of defining the median of 0, 1 data is solved by Q mid of 0.5. If you consider a sample of 0, 1 data of a size 5 with values 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 4, 1s, and a 0, the sample proportion p hat equals 4 fifths. And our definition of sample median also equals 4 fifths. The problem of accurate approximation of a discrete binomial distribution by the continuous normal distribution is best solved by Q mid. Statisticians should learn that there are two kinds of normal approximation, continuity correction and mid-probability approach. Q mid P of binomial NP distribution is accurately estimated by the normal with mean NP and variance NP1 minus P. Now we turn to slide three, where we define the identification quantile function, the quantiles of probability models for Y, and the sampling distribution quantile function. And these provide solutions to what we call problems point one, point five, one and two. First, we define the mid-quartile and the slope-quartile. Mid-quartile MQ is a half Q1 plus Q3, the mid-quartile. The slope is defined as SQ, is twice the interquartile range. That's the measure of scale. The identification quantile function QI of Y is a dimensionless value of Y, Y minus MQ divided by SQ. QI of QP is Q of P minus MQ of SQ. Problem point five, sample summary, has the solution, the sample quantile function defined by Q mid of P. Features such as symmetry, tail behavior, are diagnosed by the identification quantile QI of Y. Outliers, as defined by Tukey, are values such that QI of Y is an absolute value greater than one. I teach and apply identification quantile in the first week of my introductory statistics class. I believe that statisticians will become as enthusiastic as I am to practice applying QI of Q of P to every quantile to identify and compare quantile functions. Now problem one, identification of parametric population probability laws to fit to the data is solved by a formula for the true quantile depending on a parameter theta. In the case of a normal mu sigma, we define z to be a normal 0, 1, and the quantile function of y evaluated at p, given specified values of mu and sigma, is mu plus sigma, the quantile function at p of z. So that we have now an example of a location scale parameter family. In problem two, parameter estimation can be solved efficiently and explicitly by linear combinations of the sample quantile function, which are alternatives to computing maximum likelihood estimators. Our problem two stage of data analysis combines the study of estimators theta hat and their sampling distributions, which we describe by the quantile function of theta hat given theta, which we would denote the quantile function capital Q evaluated at capital P of theta hat given theta. Now we turn to our general solution of problem three, valid parameters that fit the data. We require an assumption which is made in most books 
on frequent statistical inference. And this assumption will come out naturally in our approach. The assumption is the sampling distribution of the quantile, the quantile of the sampling distribution, as a function of the parameter theta for a fixed p is an increasing and continuous function of the parameter. This assumption is called stochastically increasing in the parameter. The distribution function of the estimator is decreasing in the parameter. And this is a more general assumption than monotone likelihood ratio. Now, why this assumption is so powerful is that an increasing function has an inverse. We already have to find the inverse of the distribution function we call the quantile function. And now we continue this process of defining inverses of functions. Here it's going to be the inverse of the quantile function of the estimator as a function of theta. We show the endpoints of confidence intervals or confidence quantile are the inverse of the quantile function of the sampling distribution of the estimator. So the last two types of quantile in our village are the posterior quantile and the confidence quantile, which we define in slide four. The posterior quantile is denoted capital Q evaluated at capital P of the parameter theta given that theta hat the observed estimator and a prior distribution for theta. Now the confidence quantile doesn't make any assumption of a prior distribution. But in the frequentist case, we find that the numbers that we need to answer questions of statistical inference are the endpoints of confidence intervals. We take these numbers and put them into one function, and we have two notations for that function. One notation is theta evaluated at p theta hat. Another notation is the quantile notation, capital Q evaluated at capital P of the parameter theta given the estimator theta hat and no prior assumption. Problem 3.1, Bayesian inference in credible intervals is solved by the posterior quantile of the parameter given the estimator and a prior quantile for the parameter in preference to a pro posterior probability density of the parameter. Problem three, valid parameters of models that fit the data when we do not assume a prior are provided by confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, rejection regions, which in practice we derive from a confidence quantile. Now we turn to an amazing result. Confidence quantiles are computed by an estimating equation which deserves to be called the Grand Unified Theorem of Frequentist Inference. And this equation says, the sampling distribution at 1 minus p, the quantile of the sampling distribution at 1 minus p, and the confidence quantile, the thing I want to find, the confidence quantile at p are inverse functions. Now, if we turn to slide four, we see the equation, the confidence quantile of theta from the quantile of the sampling distribution of theta hat is found by fixing the quantile function of theta hat at one minus p. Now, as you vary theta, there'll be a value of theta for which this quantile function is equal to the observed value of theta hat. And that value of theta is denoted capital theta of p theta hat observed. We summarize our message. One, traditional frequentist statistical inference can be practiced by starting with a curve intuitively called the confidence curve or the confidence interval endpoint curve or the confidence quantile function of the parameter given the estimator and no prior. Two, the confidence quantile is obtained by an estimating equation involving the quantile of the sampling distribution, which he found in problem two. And three, a confidence quantile, a formula for the parameter as a function of P and an estimator, has two types of grand unified graphs. One is the confidence belt. This plots the parameter as a function of the estimator for fixed p. So the function of two variables, p and the estimator, we fix one of them, p, and we have a function of the estimator. The confidence quantile 
plots the parameter as a function of p for the fixed estimator. You fix the value of the estimator, you get a function of p. And we'll show you pictures of the confidence belt and the confidence quantile in the important normal and, and binomial cases. Now we come to slide five. This introduces the important problem of the difference of parameters of two independent samples. I regard practical solutions of two sample problems as the most difficult information to find in standard statistics textbooks. And I propose a grand unified strategy which applies both for two sample frequentists or Bayesian inference. This strategy says you can compute painlessly highly accurate frequentist confidence quantiles or Bayesian posterior quantiles for the difference of parameters by a simulation process. What you do is you have formulas for the one sample marginal confidence quantiles or posterior quantiles of each parameter. And you generate from each formula, we look in slide five, we generate from the marginal quantiles of theta one and theta two values of theta one and theta two, you take their difference, theta one minus theta two, you have a large sample of these, you order these, form the sample quantile function, and that's an approximation to the confidence quantile of the difference of two parameters from which you can obtain confidence intervals. Now, does this work? Well, I have examples of cases in literature where it's difficult to calculate confidence intervals were immediately obtained the same answers by this method. Now we turn to the important question of objective Bayesian inference. Objective Bayesian inference seeks solutions that are reproducible by different researchers who use the same data and who avoid subjective priors, which depend on individual researchers. Our proposal for a grand unified theorem of, Bayes of, Bay of combining Bayesian and frequentist inference shows, one, the posterior quantile, which is what we want to find in Bayesian inference, corresponding to conjugate priors are identical with the confidence quantile, where you find from frequentist principles, computed from enlarged posterior data sets, which combine the observed sample with a prior sample corresponding to the prior distribution of the parameters. Two, the confidence quantile of the posterior sample can be computed using frequentist estimator update formulas without any computation by Bayes' theorem, although the final conclusions agree with the conclusions obtained by the Bayesian calculus, which uses Bayes' theorem. For many purposes, we can interpret and manipulate confidence quantiles like an ordinary quantile of a random variable, in particular, we can simulate values from it. Our goal is compute frequentist, but interpret Bayesian. Statistical practice should enjoy both methods. Introductory statistical students can be taught Bayesian inference conclusions using confidence quantile formulas for a posterior sample, which combines observed sample and a sample equivalent to the prior. One can avoid difficult to learn calculation of conditional distributions. There are no practical philosophical differences between frequentist and Bayesian inference with conjugate priors. Differences in parameter quantiles, which could be confidence quantiles or posterior quantiles, if they are different answers, they're due to differences between the samples on which inference is based. And now we turn to actual concrete formulas for confidence quantiles. And we start with slide six, which discusses formulas for the confidence quantile for the mean of a normal. In this slide, we introduce the concept of a pivot. Theta minus theta hat over the standard error of theta hat has the same distribution for, you know, independent of theta, which is distribution of a random variable capital T. And therefore, we can represent the estimator, which we want to find the sample distribution of the estimator, theta hat. Theta hat is equal to theta minus the standard error of theta hat times t. From a representation for theta hat, we obtain the quantile function of theta hat. Capital Q of P of the theta hat given theta is equal to theta 
minus the standard error of theta hat times the quantile function of capital T evaluated at 1 minus P. The, this is quantile calculus because theta hat is a decreasing function of capital T. The quantile function of theta hat is the same function of capital T but evaluated at 1 minus P. However, we now made the assumption that capital T has a symmetric distribution, which means that minus the quantile function at 1 minus P of T is equal to plus the quantile function at P of T. So finally, we have a nice formula. The quantile function at P of the estimated theta hat given theta is theta plus the standard error of theta hat, the quantile function evaluated at P of T. Now you plug this formula into the estimating equation, and you quickly solve for the quantile function of theta, given that theta hat is equal to the observed theta hat, and no prior. And that's equal to theta hat observed plus the standard error theta hat, which is a sigma over the square root of n in the uh, case where sigma is known, times the quantile function at t of t. Now, if you look at the formula for the confidence quantile and compare it to the formula for the quantile of the sampling distribution of theta hat, if you evaluate the same distribution of theta hat at theta equal to theta hat observed, it's the same answer. So this is a general important formula which justifies the bootstrap method. The confidence quantile is equal to the quantile function of the sampling distribution evaluated at the observed value of the estimator. Now we turn to slide seven that discusses confidence quantiles of sigma, the normal variance sigma squared, and the correlation coefficient r capital R of a bivariate normal. Again, we start with a pivot. And we write the pivot as an increasing function of the parameter sigma squared. So the tin, I, I call it tin, tin, increasing tin, of sigma squared and S squared is sigma squared over S squared. That's an increasing function of sigma squared. And that's equal to a random variable T, which is the inverse of the average chi squared distribution of n minus 1 degrees of freedom. From that formula, we solve for the quantile function evaluated at p of sigma. We can find functions like square of sigma from sigma squared by the square root, so we conclude by the quantile calculus that the quantile function evaluated at capital P of sigma, given s squared and no prior, is s times the quantile function at p of the square root of t. Now, t being chi squared or has a nice approximation called the wilson hilferty And wilson hilferty then gives a nice approximation for the quantile function of the square root of t. We won't discuss further, but I just want to point out to you that we, this approach leads to beautiful results for the confidence quantile of the correlation coefficient, starting with a pivot, 10 of r and r hat, which is log of 1 plus r of 1 minus r minus log of 1 plus r hat of 1 minus r hat. And that's Fisher's Z-transformation, which interesting historical study is when Fisher derived the exact distribution of the correlation coefficient, Pearson insisted that he find a normal version, and he found the normal approximation, which seems to be very good, that this 10 is equal to 2z, the normal standard normal z, over the square root of n minus 3. And now we come to an extremely important problem, the problem of the confidence quantile for the Bernoulli parameter this appears in slide eight. This has a very fascinating story. Who is Wilson? E.B. Wilson was the founder of the Harvard School of Public Health Department of Statistics. And in 1927, and subsequently, he published some papers about count intervals for P. And he found this formula, so in his honor we call it Wilson. The sampling distribution of P hat is discrete. We apply the estimating equation for the confidence quantile of the parameter to the mid-quantile approximated by the quantile of the normal of mean NP and variance NP1 minus P. And we obtain a solution, this function little p of capital P, P hat, and N, from which we can calculate the endpoints of the confidence interval for, for the parameter little p. Traditional confidence intervals for the parameter little p is equivalent to letting the constant c of capital P equal to zero. Then it reduces to the traditional formula, and we teach this as acceptable for homework problems when k, which is n p hat, the number of successes in the sample is greater than 30. And now to simulate a sample from the Wilson quantile is easy because you take the Wilson formula 
replace capital P of Z by a normal 0, 1, capital Z, and that simulates values from the confidence quantile. Now, Bayesian inference for P, which ha where the, we have conjugate priors, which are assumed to be a beta AB, the posterior is beta K plus A and minus K plus B. Jeffrey's prior, the uninformative prior, corresponds to A, B, A equal B equal 0.5. Now, our philosophy that we can approximate posterior quantiles by confidence quantile says we should approximate the beta K plus 0.5 and minus K plus 0.5, the Bayesian posterior quantile for P, by Wilson's formula, where we use for P hat K plus a half divided by N plus 1, and for N we replace by N plus 1. Now, if K is greater than 10, Bayesian books say that the normal approximation to beta may be acceptable. And we'll see pictures of this. And now we turn to the interesting examples, which are in slides 9, 10, through 16. And we start with slide 9. Slide 9 is a picture of the confidence belt of the normal. And here, what we do is we plot it in the parameter theta, estimate a theta hat plane. And we have contour plots of the conditional quantile of theta hat given theta. So for fixed theta, the acceptance region for hypothesis testing is the interval of values of theta hat between values of the quantile function of theta hat for that fixed value of theta. And then for fixed theta hat, the confidence interval for theta given theta hat is between the values of the confidence quantile, Q of P theta given theta hat. Now, if we look at the graph in slide 10, this is a confidence belt. A confidence belt is a beautiful construction that unfortunately is not as well known to statisticians as it should be, although a, a brief mention of it appears in some books. It's credited to Naiman, 1937. And, and I should point out that this kind of idea of the contour plot of conditional quantiles, in fact, can be applied to regression analysis. We have x and y. But here we have theta and theta hat. And each line corresponds to a different value of p, the traditional values of p, 0.95 down to 0.01 and so on. And so if you fi fix the value of theta in the slide 10, you get a vertical line. And that value of theta, you could find the interval between specified lines of desired confidence levels. And that would be the acceptance region for the hypothesis of theta being the true parameter value. Now, we've set the, what's different about this graph of the confidence belt, we've centered it at the observed value of theta hat, comma theta hat. So it, it's, in fact, been drawn. If people say, what if you change theta hat? Well, I'd redraw the graph to center it at theta hat, theta hat. Now, the intersection at the horizontal line theta hat equal theta hat observed with each of those slanted lines, which are the confidence quantiles of theta hat, by the estimating equation, those are the values of the confidence quantile. So the confidence quantile of theta given theta hat are along the line of where I fixed theta hat equal theta hat observed. And uh, then if I want to find the confidence region, the confidence interval, they are the interval between those endpoints of the confidence intervals. Now we turn to the confidence belt of the binomial, slide 11. In slide 11, we in fact have on the x-axis the estimator p hat and on the y-axis the parameter theta. And for fixed p hat, the confidence interval between the values of the confidence quantile, q of p, capital P of the parameter little p, given p hat and no prior. For fixed, for fixed p, the probability acceptance region of p hat is between, the, is between the values of capital Q of capital P of p hat. And in general, if you have a, a graph of a confidence belt, if you rotate it 90 degrees and flip it over, because of the inverse property, in one reading it, the way it's drawn, you have a graph of the, com of the confidence intervals. And if you flip it over, you have a graph of the acceptance regions of the probability intervals for theta hat given theta. But in addition, 
Our graph, slide 12, of the constant belt of the binomial has a lot of functions graphed on it. For values of p, specified values of p, we have drawn the confidence quantile computed by Wilson's formula. We have drawn dots at p hat equal 0.1 through 0.9 of the values of the beta distribution for a Jeffries prior. So that's beta k plus a half and minus k plus a half. And we've also drawn the values from Wilson's formula applied to the posterior sample, the corresponds to the original sample and the prior sample of, of a half a half, success and failure, and an additional sample size of one. And all those values geometrically agree. If you look at the numerical values, they differ in the third place. So that's an example of a confidence belt drawn for the binomial. Now we turn to slide 13. This is a graph of normal parameter quantiles. And here what we plot on the x-axis is the parameter p from 0 to 1, and the parameter mu is on the y-axis. Now we plot on this one graph in the slide 13, we have all the four functions that are defined there. The four functions that we plot on one graph that are related to understand what the relationship is. First is the quantile function of the prior distribution. Where in the normal case, we're assuming this is normal, the conjugate prior. And we have a normal with mean mu naught and standard deviation sigma naught, standard normal. The posterior will also be normal, and it'll have parameters mu one and sigma one, which we can obtain by update formulas from mu naught and sigma naught and the parameters of the sample. The parameters of the sample are mu hat and the standard error of mu hat, which is sigma over the square root of n. So we have three quantile functions, the prior, the no prior and the posterior. Now, an additional important function is the relative likelihood function. If you take the likelihood function of the parameter mu at the value observed of mu hat and divide it by the maximum likelihood, you get a number between 0 and 1, whose value is capital P. And we plot that, so to speak, reversed as P is a function of mu. And now we turn to the graph in slide 14. And in slide 14, what you see are the bottom, if you look at above one, the bottommost graph is the quantile function of the prior. And the next quantile function is the quantile function of the posterior. And the topmost quantile function is the quantile function of the, the sample. Now, each quantile function gives rise to a confidence interval. So there's a confidence interval, which the bottommost confidence interval. It projects on the mu axis the values at the curve at p equal to 0 0.025, 0 0.975, 95% percent confidence interval. And we get the confidence interval from the Bayesian and the confidence interval for the frequentist. In addition, there's a third confidence interval, which we obtain from the likelihood function using the likelihood ratio principles. And that agrees with the confidence interval for the, for the frequentist. Now, the reason I emphasize plotting the likelihood function on the graph along with the three quantile functions is because the link between a prior quantile and the posterior quantile is the likelihood function. In general, if you specify a quantile function, a, a prior quantile numerically, you don't have a formula for it, you don't have a conjugate prior, and you want to compute the posterior quantile, the way you do that is by simulation. You simulate a sample from the prior quantile. Now, for each value mu from the sample from the prior, you evaluate the likelihood function, the relative likelihood function at mu. It's a number p between 0 and 1. You generate a uniform random variable 0, 1, and you compare that uniform 0, 1 random variable with the value of p. If it's less than p, you accept the value of mu. If it's greater than p, you reject the value of mu. Now, the collection of all the accepted values of mu has a sample quantile function. And that sample quantile function, the accepted values of mu, is the posterior quantile function. Now, it may be that you get the confidence quantile numerically, like from the bootstrap. Well, the density of the distribution of the confidence quantile is the likelihood function. So in fact, we can estimate that likelihood numerically if we could ha have a formula for the confidence quantile. And if we have a likelihood, we can apply Bayes' theorem. Give me a prior, and I'll get you the posterior. So it's important to understand the relation between in the confidence quantile graph domain. We have three graphs, the posterior, 
the prior, the confidence, and the relative likelihood. Now we turn to the two-sample problem. In the two-sample problem, which I regard as a great contribution of this approach, but I don't think, I've looked in standard textbooks on Bayesian, I won't mention names of the authors, I can find any information how they recommend you obtain a confidence interval for the difference of two parameters, theta 1 minus theta 2. Now here is the important case where theta 1 is log odds of P1 and theta 2 is log odds of P2. So I have a 2 by 2 table with two sample independent of P1 and P2. Now for each one sample, a confidence quantile for theta 1, because it's the monotone function of P1, is the, is, the, is the same monotone function of the confidence quantile for P1. So Wilson's formula gives me immediately a, a formula and a graph of the quantile function of theta 1, given theta 1 hat and no prior, and the quantile function of theta 2, given theta 2 hat and no prior. And my goal is to find the quantile function of theta 1 at of the parameter theta 1 minus theta 2, given the parameters theta 1 hat, theta 2 hat, and no prior. And we do that by simulation of the sample quantile of theta hat minus theta hat, theta 1 hat minus theta 2 hat. And this leads us to a confidence interval for the difference of log odds, which is an important summary of 2 by 2 tables. And this method is painless. You can apply it repeatedly. So now we have a graph in slide 16. And in this graph, a graph of confidence quantiles. It's a, fun a graph of capital, a function of capital P between 0 and 1. But the y-axis y are essentially numbers that correspond to log odds. The bottommost graph is, P, is uh, P1. The topmost graph is P2. So if I simulate samples in the bottommost graph and, and samples in the topmost graph and take that difference and form the sample quantile function, then the sample quantile of the difference is theta 1 minus theta 2 is the confidence quantile for theta 1 minus theta 2, which in the case here is the difference of log odds. And if I take the values of that confidence quantile at p equal 0.025 and p equal 0.975, I get the confidence interval for P1 for the difference of log odds. Well, this represents the basic theory that I feel can be used both for the practice of statistics and for teaching of statistics. That when I teach statistics, I emphasize that we have a strategy to be employed in every problem of S, analysis of the sample quantile, I, identification of the parametric model, E, estimation of the parameters of the parametric model by theta hat, and finding the atomic distribution, and th problem three, the actual answer to statistical inference is provided by the confidence quantile. Now let me make a brief remark about the history of the applications. The, the idea of hypothesis testing was very popular among uh, applied people. And then they were told, no, that isn't really a good method. You should use confidence intervals. So for the last 15 years, Confidence intervals have been a popular method among applied people. But now the idea is emerging that the confidence interval requires you to specify a, an, it's an arbitrary number, a 95% interval, which doesn't really, the statistician should be choose, shouldn't make, be making that choice. So we can give the client a whole curve, the confidence curve, and clients will learn how to compare experiments by the property of the confidence curve, the confidence quantile. For the confidence quantile, you can find estimators of location by mid-quartile. And most importantly, you can apply identification quantile to the confidence quantile and obtain interesting characteristics of that quantile, symmetry, long-tailedness, and so on. And so when you have the problem of comparing 42 by 2 tables to find out the difference of log odds, I think that uh, we can do interesting diagnostics on 40 confidence quantiles, the difference of log odds, which will enable us to answer the needs of, of applied people to find out which treatment, in this case for stomach ulcers, uh, perform better. So I'm very happy to have had this opportunity to talk to you about my favorite topic, quantiles. And people say, 
Are you a Bayesian? Well, it's not I'm a Bayesian. I think the future of statistics requires us to practice both Bayesian and frequency statistics. And furthermore, the problem of teaching statistics, we certainly want to teach frequency statistics, and we certainly want to introduce Bayesian thinking. So my point is we can think Bayesian as well as think frequentist, but we only need to compute frequentist in introductory statistics. And furthermore, I want to emphasize that the assumption that seems to be present in introductory statistics, statistical inference, is the assumption that the quantile function of the sampling distribution is an increasing function of the parameter. That's the only assumption we've made, and because of that assumption, we have an inverse of that function, which is the confidence quantile. So I don't see how people can not love confidence quantiles. Thank you very much for your attention. Manny, thank you. Thank you kindly for a stimulating lecture that will be preserved in the archives of the American Statistical Association. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all.